Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. Do you know that there was a virus that killed 80,000 people in America? Yes, that virus is called influenza. Influenza killed in 2018, just a couple of years ago, 80,000 Americans. And today, May 11th, we have just crossed the 80,000 death toll for COVID-19. Now, the first thing I want to make clear is I'm not saying this to make an equivalence. Like, do you see what I mean? We didn't even notice the 2018 pandemic and this one, we're making a whole lot of big deal. No, quite the opposite. It's just to illustrate, in fact, that COVID-19 is a much, much deadlier virus than the influenza virus of 2018. I was actually in Africa at the time, and so I didn't even hear anything about the 2018 death of 80,000 Americans. And my mom, I just asked her today, I said, hey, do you remember in 2018, 80,000 Americans dying of the flu? She said, no, I don't. I'm like, okay. Just curious. And now my mom watches the news religiously every single day, all the time. And yet she doesn't remember that. So it just shows you how low it was on our conscience, even though 80,000 Americans were killed by this deadly virus. What a lot of people confuse is the case fatality rate versus the infection fatality rates. I just remember about in February, I had a really bad headache. I had flu-like symptoms in February. Now, the COVID uh, crisis had just started, just started to trickle into the United States and into California. And I started getting a splitting headache. And, and I had all sorts of other flu-like symptoms. I said, I know it can't be COVID because it just came to America. So who knows? So I went to the hospital, though, anyway, because I was taking my mom to the hospital for a different procedure. And when I was taking her to the hospital, I had some extra time. So I just went up to a, you know, a nurse right at the reception there. I said, hi, you know, I have a really bad fever. Can, or not really bad, because obviously I'm walking around, but I have, I have a fever, I think. Can somebody take my temperature to just see how bad it is? No. I said, what? You, you won't take my temperature? No. I'm like, I'm not asking for a COVID-19 test. I know those are hard to come by. I'm just asking to take my temperature to just see where it's at. Nope. We're only, we're saving all our resources for the people who are most critical need. And you don't look like you're so bad. He did, she didn't say that, but that was implied. So it just showed that, wow, there's probably a whole lot of people who have the symptoms of COVID and are not being tested. This was, of course, a couple of months ago, back in February. But still, even today, uh, there are people that find it hard to, to get tested for it. So I think we're severely underestimating the amount of asymptomatic people. And I find it interesting how we value deaths also. Um, that's another fascinating topic. Some people say, no, you can't value a life. Life is precious everywhere. Bullshit. That's not true. We actually do. Life insurance companies do this all the time. They actually put a price tag on your head when they decide whether how much money you're going to get when you die. That is literally, we are valuing life down to the dollar. You get a million dollar life insurance policy, you are worth a million bucks dead. United States military. I've always been curious, like, what happens if somebody dies? Does their family get compensated? Well, they do. Guess how much? $100,000. Now, that could be a lot or a little, depending on your perspective. Frankly, I think it's kind of very little from my perspective because I was like, well, that guy just served his country and did a lot and and he died fighting for his country and he just gets a hundred thousand bucks or not him, but his family, his survivors, his next of kin. But that's who it is. I guess I suppose, you know, it should be an honor to serve your country since it's an all volunteer army, et cetera. We won't get into all that stuff. But the point is it's a hundred thousand dollars. Now, another case where an uh, American soldier killed an Afghan child, a boy, and they gave his father one thousand dollars as compensation for the accidental death. So clearly lives in low income countries are not worth as much as lives in high-income countries. Lives of probably rich people are less than poor people. It's just, this is a very ugly topic, but that's the reality of it. Now, I've been called callous 
by my friend Alicia, who said, Francis, you're very callous for just looking at this thing in such a cold way, effectively, is what she said. And it's true, I suppose. But I guess my point to her is that we're all kind of callous. We all make this kind of calculation of like, how much is this shutdown worth? Give you three examples. Think about these three examples. Number one, imagine if we decided to lower the speed limit down to 10 miles an hour nationwide. How would you feel about that? You know, we would save, we'd probably almost eliminate all traffic accidents. I don't think you could die in a car going at 10 miles an hour. So right away, boom, we'd solve, I don't know how many traffic deaths worldwide, uh, nationwide, tens of thousands, obviously, and they'd be gone. And not to mention just deaths, but you know, mutilation and, and other broken bones and all sorts of terrible other things. People survive car accidents all the time, but they get really screwed up. And they have lifelong uh, chronic injuries as a result. Number two, what if we treated every single airplane flight like it was a SpaceX rocket launch? In other words, we would take maybe seven hours to get ready for it. So here, checking. Checking. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're gonna check the doors again. Okay. Let's uh, let's uh, look at that again. Uh, let's prepare to do the evacuation. Okay. We're gonna run the oxygen through your mask. Okay. <sighs> Breathe. <sighs> Breathe. Okay. We got it. Now put it over your child. Now we're gonna go over the procedure one more time. Okay. And what? And uh, everybody, let's do this all over again. Let's practice, and we do that every single time. Seven hours it takes. Now. I imagine that, and we do all this preparation, we would certainly cut airline deaths in half. But would you be in favor of it? Probably not. Already people hate the fact that they got to take their shoes and belt off, which just takes a few seconds to go through airport security. Can you imagine going through all that? And yet we would save a lot of lives. Same thing with influenza and communicable diseases. We have 5 million people who die every year from communicable diseases. Which diseases are these? Well, um, according to the World Health Organization, lower respiratory infections kill 3 million people worldwide every year. Diarrheal infections, which is another communicable disease, kills about 1.5 million people. And tuberculosis, tuberculosis kills about 1 million people. Uh, a year. So add that up, it's over 5 million. And communicable diseases could be nearly halted, just like we're halting the corona, the COVID virus or the co or coronavirus, by just sheltering in place 365 days a year. And you're telling me that you value life? Why are you letting these 5 million deaths happen every year? What are you doing? You could, should be fighting with your politicians and saying, no, we need to save those 5 million lives. We need to close down business 24-7, 365 days a year, all the time. We just got to learn how to make do. And those are going to be the lives we're going to save. And yet, we're callous. We are all saying, no, hell no, fuck that. I'm going to, I need to work. I need to earn my bread. I need to make money. I have to do something. Well, you could be saving all these lives. Tough shit. And that's effectively what we're saying. We don't like to tell that story because we all like to have a story that makes sense to us, a story that we care for other people, that we love other people, that we value life. We certainly value innocent life and we want to protect life and we want to save lives, every types, young, old, etc. But isn't it funny how we react differently when an old person dies versus a young person dies? You know, the 95 year old person died, grandma died. Oh yeah, that's really sad. Now a five year old child just died in a car accident. <gasps> that's tragic. And yet they're both lives, but our reaction is quite uh, different. A person who's dying of cancer at uh, 80 versus a person dying of leukemia at 14, very different reactions. So I guess we need to have a little bit of reflection and realize that we all make this mental calculus in our head about lives versus other things, other, you know, whether it's economy or you might just want to think of it as lives versus lives because the economy is our livelihood. In other words, it allows us to have health care. It allows us to free our minds from depression that 
allows us to work and give ourselves purpose and gives ourselves a reason to, to help our children and feed the family, etc. That's all livelihood. It's both mental and physical and economic. It's all tied together. And so when we shut down that economy, we infringe and, and impede that livelihood, which then impacts our lives. And so that's, I guess, the disconnect. And the final thing I'll say is that a lot of people misunderstand me and others who suggest that, hey, we need to end the shutdown. And it's not that they, they kind of imagine in their head like shutdown is like we have to end it completely. We're going to like go exactly like we were back in January or last year in 2019. Just everything 100% normal. No, I'm not saying that. I don't think a lot of people who say open up the economy are doing that. I think following the Swedish model, which is, I think, quite prudent and and the middle of the road, they're saying, okay, People who are vulnerable, the most vulnerable population, which are certainly the elderly people, anybody who's over 55, shelter in place. Maybe mandate that even, just like they're mandating it for the entire population. But open up schools. Kids are very low probability of dying from this. Um, then you have uh, businesses. You can tell people if you can work from home, work from home. That's what we prefer. We want you to work from home. But if you can't, if let's say you are a server at a restaurant or you work at a movie theater, you need to actually physically show up there. So go and physically show up there. Now, for the rest of the population who does go out to the movie theater, to the restaurant, well, then we need to space people apart by one and a half meters. We need to all wear masks. We all need to wash our hands and have either sanitizers or places to, to clean our, our hands. Uh, make sure that we have distance, social distance from everybody else. You can do all that and run a quasi-economy. A quasi-economy and a little bit of economy is better than zero economy. And yet it will certainly help keep the infection level quite low. And we've, we'll have, we've already flattened the curve and we can keep it kind of low and under control. And it won't spiral out of control because we're taking precautions that we never have before. And maybe those precautions will stand in place for a couple of years until we get maybe a vaccine, if we're so lucky, maybe in a year or two. So in the meantime, we need to kind of move forward. The keeping it shelter in place forever is not a realistic option, in my opinion. But what the hell do I know? I ain't no doctor. I ain't no economist. I'm just a guy blabbing on the internet. Anyway, hope that was uh, fruitful and thoughtful. Tell me your comments. Make some comments on the video or the podcast. And uh, this is France Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn.